Thanks. So um, I, I have a, a bit of a lecture prepared and um, just be aware, I'm not, I'm not uh, gonna try to make this lecture comprehensive. I mean, there is, uh, Dr. Adams does a day long workshop and I think this could easily be a five day workshop um, on, on what enmeshment is. Um, so I'm I'm trying to distill this around uh, down to the uh, the factors that make enmeshment and the factors that break enmeshment. So I'm really trying to get this down to the pure thing. And then in in the Q and A, um, we can expand conversation and we can um, go in specific directions. Um, so if you have a question again, use the Q and A feature. Um, we won't uh, take raised hands or you know give anyone audio. So. Um, use the the Q and A feature if you have questions, and you can put those in right now. Um, so let's start with what enmeshment is. Um, enmeshment is uh, a th there's actually a lot of ways that enmeshment is used in the literature. So I'm going with um, Dr. Adams' conceptualization of enmeshment. Um, enmeshment is a family system that prioritizes loyalty above all else. So think about that for a minute. Um, enmeshment is a family system where the pressure, where there is pressure to go in a specific direction. Um, enmeshment describes the uh, consequences. It describes the, um, uh, the damage done by a family system that is organized around and operates around um, pressure for its uh, participants um, to be and act a certain way. So enmeshment, enmeshed systems, they operate on inappropriate guilt and forced obligation to maintain ties. Um, I say inappropriate guilt and forced obligation because one of the things that I'm learning through my work with couples is guilt is not a bad thing um, in and of itself. Guilt is an emotion that can help us understand when we've hurt another person or we've done something wrong. Inappropriate guilt would be um, the application, the creation of guilt in order to keep people in line or motivate people to act in the way you want them to versus guilt that comes up because I'm recognizing that I have not been true to myself or true to you. Um, and then the forced obligation, again, obligation, I think, can be a really good force in relationships when you give your obligation. So, for example, I think there's a difference between I have I have uh, too many babies in my house right now, so I have babies on the brain all the time. Um, there's a difference between I have to take care of this kid because they're small. And making the choice, I'm going to give you the best of everything that I have. Because I want you to have the best shot at having a full integrated brain and life. Notice that both are obligation. One is an obligation I'm giving myself to, I'm stepping into because I want to, I think this is best. And even on days that I wake up and don't want to, I'm gonna make myself do it because I'm committed versus a forced obligation, which is you have no choice. You're still gonna do it whether you feel it or not, but uh, you'll build resentment. Um, you'll build conflict as a result of doing it rather than my obligation, the commitment that I make is a path to being more myself and more in line with myself. So um, the problem with enmeshment is it encroaches on the individual's ability to develop identity. Um, identity is really, really important. There is no we without me first. And that's not saying that the priorities are I will always think about myself first. It's saying um, unless you have a concept of me, you cannot give yourself to a we or put a we ahead of yourself because you have to know where you end and your, your obligation to others begins. So in enmeshment, um, the ability to develop a separate identity, my own sharp edges, my own internal compass point is really compromised. Um, and that doesn't allow a person to give themselves to a relationship because the, again, there is no concept of me, I'm mine, I own myself and I can give myself to things. It's I exist for the service of others. And I already alluded to this and we'll talk about this a little bit more. One of the biggest outcomes of that I see is resent, our relationships cause resentment for us. 
when we are not an agent um, unto ourselves, when, he can, when we uh, can't give ourselves willingly to a relationship, when it's extracted out of us, forced out of us. Um, the earlier this dynamic starts, the more devastating its effects. There's a lot of reasons why enmeshment happens. It's really common in single parent systems. And I actually think it's one of the most natural things in the world. Like after a divorce or the death of a, a parent, I think it's one of the most natural things in the world for the um, single parent to rely more on their children, emotionally, socially, um, getting stuff done. Um, that's understandable. Um, but there is an impact, especially when a child is born into a family where even before birth, their role is predetermined and um, what they must be in the system is already decided. So if you think about it, like things with like uh, terror, trauma, things like that, the earlier it's encoded in the brain, the more it influences the overall structure and, and building of the brain. It's the same thing with enmeshment. So we tend to see more devastating effects uh, when, it's, when it's early because um, another way of looking at enmeshment, it's when the parental enmeshment is when the needs of the parents consume the child. Um, individual identity development suffers because the priority isn't you need to be who you are and we foster that. It's I need your support, your love, your admiration, your friendship, whatever it is. Um, and that's priority one. So essentially, you could think of it as gosh, this is a, a bleak image, a bonsai child. I need you to be this shape. So from day one, I put you in this container and you're going to be a box child. Your bones are going to grow that way. Um, all your internal organs are going to organize that way. Not uh, you find the form that works best for you. And then I'll figure out how to be uh, in connection with that is um, I need to preform you to, to connect easily with me. So individual identity is made up of our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, our beliefs, attitudes, our experiences, and our perceptions of those experiences. All those go into um, our identity, what makes us who we are. Those get bent in service of the parents' needs. So you don't have an individual, you have a proxy, you have a um, you know, nar narcissism uh, in the parent and enmeshment are often things that we see together you have an outgrowth of the parent and that's by the parents doing not by the child's choice. Um, so there are some impacts as the individual develops um, in order to maintain loyalty as defined by the family an individual will often. So again, um, loyalty is mandatory. It's not another choice. Uh, you'll suffer greatly if you cross us or you cross me. Um, so in order to uh, survive, because um, you, you actually, it's, it's actually really, really difficult to extinguish an individual. That part of a person's always going to be going, but it's going to be in conflict with the loyalty to the family. One way that this comes up, is, it's an everyday experience for uh, those of you that have kids. Uh, kids get angry. Um, you can squash identity development when a kid gets angry and you make them sit by themselves till they feel better. That part of you is not acceptable. There is no uh, reason under heaven why you should ever be angry. Um, so just don't do that. Versus um, a, a parent or a system that says, oh, you're angry. Why is that? Oh, okay. Well, that makes sense to me. People get angry for that. Uh, to totally makes sense that you're angry. Let's talk about what we're going to do about it. Um, let's talk about why. Let's talk about what you can do with that anger instead of trying to make it go away and try to make the part of this person go away that doesn't serve you. And I'll tell you, um, I think some of my most annoying parenting moments are when I have to honor my kids' anger. Because <laughs> I often think they're wrong. <laughs> but it's not about right or wrong. It's about helping that, <laughs> that kid develop um, their own identity and their own relationship with themselves, not about them serving me. So in order to survive... Um, uh, people will often develop the ability to placate instead of be genuine. So placating is I'll tell you, I'll show you what you want to hear to make you go away, to make you stop the pressure on me for now. Placation is all right in the short term for reducing stress. Um, it guarantees resentment going forward. 
Um, and it furthers, it's almost this destructive cycle because the more the resentment builds, um, the less it's accepted in the system where it's building. So this is where splitting starts to happen and we get secret lives. Um, there's a whole side of me and what I feel and what I want that I can never, ever show you. And so, um, again, it's hard to extinguish an individual. So that individual part, uh, that individuality goes into secrecy. It can fuel addiction. It can fuel dishonesty, uh, things like that. Um, they'll often care for the parent above all else, leaving no ability to securely function in any relationship. So again, loyalty to the parent is number one. Um, that means uh, any feelings or needs that I have that are in opposition to what my parent wants, I can't bring those to the surface with that parent or anybody else. In uh, romantic relationships, this causes a problem because the parent is always the primary. The uh, romantic partner, the committed partner of my choosing can never be my number one because that spot is reserved for mom or dad or the family. Um, which those of you who are in a committed relationship uh, can see the problem there. Um, I'm not devoting my life to you to be number two. Um, they may keep family secrets at great personal cost. Um, we can actually see uh, the impact in the body of uh, truth and emotions that aren't allowed to see the light of day. Uh, chronic disease can come from that. Um, if you want more on that, uh, Gabor Mate writes a lot about that. Um, he's actually got a new book, uh, The Myth of Normal, um, that talks about some of that connection. Um, they may forego their own dreams and desires to maintain their role in the family. Uh, I can't tell you in the hundred or so, hundred plus men that I've worked with in these workshops now, um, I can't tell you how often I've heard um, I never wanted to work in the family business or I never wanted to be a doctor. We, we see a lot of doctors. I never wanted to be a doctor. My mom wanted me to be a doctor. Um, I wanted to engineer or I wanted to play with dirt or, you know, I would have rather, I worked with one guy. Um, he was uh, leaving his career as a doctor and he wanted to become a therapist. And he said, my mom just didn't respect that. So I didn't do it. And he was like in his fifties. I'm pursuing a second career. I always wanted to do this. Instead, I went to medical school. They'll often develop a secret life. What this does is it allows them to experience relief um, from the sphere of enmeshment. Um, so um, the, the secret life is the place where I get to, uh, it's not be myself, it's I get to be free of your influence. Um, and that allows them to experience relief without becoming outwardly disloyal. And in a lot of enmeshed families, the secret life, uh, they don't really care about it or not concerned about it unless it could bring embarrassment to the family. But if it's really secret and you've got it under wraps, I don't care that you're drinking yourself stupid every night, or I don't care that you are running around and cheating. Just don't let it come back to me. In essence, the system is saying, do whatever you've got to do to cope here, just as long as you're loyal. Um, so uh, why, in, why address enmeshment? Aren't close families a good thing? Um, I will say, yes, close families are a very good thing. Um, it's one of my goals as a parent. I want my uh, children to feel close to me. I want them to be able to be close to me. And I want to be close to them too. Um, there's a problem, I think often when I talk to folks about enmeshment, the, the frame up is what's right or wrong, what's, what's too much or too little, that's the wrong frame up. Because it comes from the focus of what's right, um, what's wrong, that's not what this is about. Um, enmeshment, the problem with enmeshment is that the compass points in the relationship are inappropriate guilt and forced obligation not how close we are as a result. Um, for example, and this, <laughs> this may sound crazy to some of you who are maybe early on in this journey, you could be completely emancipated and still talk to your mother every day if that's what you're choosing, if that's what you want, if that is really good for you and everybody who depends on you. 
Um, it has to be a both end. So it's not a matter of if I'm breaking free from enmeshment, I should never talk to my mom or I can only once a month or only at Christmas time. That's that's not it. It's how do you need to arrange this so that inappropriate guilt and forced obligation are not your, your drivers. Um, obligation can also be a really powerful thing. However, I see enmeshed men, they're almost allergic to it. They're allergic to obligation. They're allergic to commitment. Um, they're allergic to purpose because these are all things that they have felt trapped by. So another reason to address uh, enmeshment dynamics is um, the ability that you have to give yourself to something that's bigger than you or outside of you can be a springboard for huge growth. But first you have to have the ability to say, I'm mine, I'm me. And I make the decisions about where my time and my loyalty and my attention goes. I don't do that out of obligation. I don't let you set my schedule or let you set my priorities. I do that. Um, an example of this, a little over a year ago, Dr. Adams and I were, it's when I started doing the online workshops, maybe it was two years ago, it was right after Christmas. And um, so he was he was teaching in the first round, uh, the, the introduction to the workshop, and he was giving an example from his own life uh, of how to have a boundary. And he said, coming in here, it was about 10 minutes before, you know, the meeting was going to start and he wanted to turn on the Zoom. And his wife asked him, uh, will you take the Christmas tree out to the street? And he said, sorry, I can't. And one of the big things we work on the, in the workshop is to be able to say no or yes without the preamble, without the explanation, just have the boundary. So that's, so he said, I said, I'm sorry, I can't. And during the breaks, uh, Dr. Adams and I would call each other and talk about how things were going and what we were seeing. So the, the break comes up and he calls me, he says, forgive me if there's some background noise and I'm out of breath, I'm taking the Christmas tree to the curb. And we both started laughing and he said, but it's on my terms. And that made us laugh harder. Um, but there's a, there's a truth to that. It's one thing to have somebody say, this is what you must do. And I need you to do this. And for you to not experience a choice, it's another thing to be able to say yes. And I will when, or I can fit that in here. So he could take the tree out to the street with no, no feathers ruffled. And he, he, I'm sure could have done a million more things that day and probably did do a million more things that day that his spouse wanted him to. But it comes from my, my time, my attention, my obligation. It's mine to give, not yours to take. It's a world of difference in relationships. Um, so that ability to tap into a relationship where we both are willingly giving ourselves and willingly committing and obligating ourselves to the health and well-being of this, that's not an option if you have enmeshment going on or you haven't dealt with the psychic imprint of enmeshment issues. Um, another reason why is secret lives are often fueled, or I should, let me say it this way, secret lives are fueled by, uh, secret lives that are fueled by enmeshment have to continue when there is inappropriate guilt and forced obligation. And when those aren't physically and existentially addressed. So physical boundaries are important. I've talked to a lot of people who said, well, I haven't talked to my mother in years and my mother's been dead for years. Do I still need to work on enmeshment? And all I point them to is, well, how's your marriage going? Well, it sucks. What's the complaint you get most often? My partner doesn't feel like they're a priority. That's the existential side of this. You can set physical boundaries as an important place to start. You have to deal with the psychic imprint of um, your parent. For, for many people, I had a guy in a workshop once, his mother had died 45 years previously. And he said, I know I still need to be here because I still think in terms, would she be happy with me? Or what would mom think? Or at that point, it was what would my sisters think? Because his sisters took on kind of this agent of mom type thing. So let's talk for just a second about how to break free and still love your parent. That's the, that's the tagline on overcomingenmeshment.com uh, where we house the workshops and a lot of uh, good information about enmeshment, how to break free and still love your parent if you want to. Um, because uh, amputation is not healing. Amputation is not addressing the enmeshment dynamic. And honestly, most people we work with don't really want that with their families. It's not like they hate their families or their mother. It's that the guilt and the obligation is crushing them. 
They want out of the guilt and obligation, not necessarily the relationship. And that's possible. So here's some ways to do it. Um, you have to eliminate the denial around what this has and is costing you. So just like in 12 steps uh, and, and a lot of addiction recovery, we take inventories. How has this been unmanageable? What are the consequences right now? You have to be able to do that with enmeshment. What is this costing me? Um, my spouse uh, is a stranger, uh, is treated like a stranger in uh, my family gatherings. We fight all the time about how I'm going to spend my time. Um, I can't pursue the job that I want. I can't pursue the relationship, the love that I want. Um, count those costs. It's painful, but it helps to focus you and helps you to make a real determination about whether or not the, the price you're paying is, is actually worth it. Um, accept your, that your parent or your family doesn't have to become the enemy. So again, this isn't about amputation. Even if by you breaking free, you become the enemy. Um, I, I come across a lot of my intimate knowledge of enmeshment, honestly. Um, and I'll tell you, as I've practiced some breaking free and some, and some boundaries with my family, um, I've often gotten feedback. Why don't you like us? Uh, why do you hate us? Um, that's not, uh, that's not what I'm doing. And I can't, uh, I can't succumb to fighting fire with the fire. Fine, if that's the way it's going to be, why are you such a jerk? Because that's not how I see it. That's not how I want to see it. So accept that your family's not the enemy, even if you become the enemy to them. You're saying no, not to the relationship, but to living under guilt and obligation as your primary motivations. And I'll tell you, every time that I've oriented that way, I'm saying no to guilt and obligation. I'm less angry. I'm less ambivalent. I'm more able to fully step into and inhabit the parts of my life that <laughs> give me energy and purpose and meaning. Um, get into therapy. Um, this doesn't happen only with confrontation or boundaries. Uh, emancipation doesn't. Um, your personhood was built around the needs of another and you're gonna need help rebuilding and restructuring that. There are so many loopholes we get into, so many ways that the guilt and the obligation just recycle and remanifest themselves. So you need an outside perspective to help you see the ways that you're still structured, even after you've set boundaries, even after you've had confrontation. Um, I plugged a little bit before overcomingmeshment.com. We have workshops. Um, we have workshops for enmeshed men. We have workshops for enmeshed women. We have workshops for couples who are ready to move on um, in their relationship free from the influence of enmeshment um, on a monthly basis. Uh, Dr. Adams offered, and I'll be offering this year, Coffee with Ken and Coffee with John. It's a, it's a coaching opportunity. Um, there's videos. There's books. Um, get help outside of yourself. Um, because restructuring our neurocircuitry does not happen in isolation and it doesn't happen in our heads. It happens through relationship. Um, you can also work on clearly defining the legacy that you're working towards that is independent from taking care of others. Again, taking care of others is not the enemy, but it's not all that you are. There are other parts of you, other interests, other, other facets of you that are fed um, not through caretaking, but from living. So you have to have a legacy that is not just built around taking care of others. That's about your passion and your purpose. That helps to keep you focused. It gives you a place to come back to when you stray. Because I, I will say enmeshment recovery is a lifelong thing. You don't set some boundaries and bam, I'm done. It's a lot like addiction recovery. It requires some maintenance and there's layers and layers uh, that you work on. Um, you can also work on feeling and accepting all of your emotions and your instincts. And here's why. Your ability to feel yourself was sacrificed to your family system. So again, that example of anger. I'm angry. Anger is a normal, natural part of everybody. But if my family can't take it, if it devastates my mother, if it uh, sends my father off the edge, that part of me I've now lopped off. And um, it's usually when I, when I work with the mesh folks, it's not just like one or two parts of themselves they've, they've lopped off that they've distanced themselves from. It's significant parts of their emotional experience. 
So when you start to feel and accept those emotions, that's how you find yourself. That's how you start to develop and reclaim identity. Um, it also, those dissociated feelings, they become a submerged part of you that drives acting out. Um, whether that's through addiction, whether that's through poor relationship and behavior, it's just a fact uh, that the emotional experiences we have that we have not resolved become conscious of. And resolve isn't saying, well, it didn't affect me that much. Resolve is integrating, not pushing out. Um, so when we integrate our feelings, we have more of a power of choice in our relationships. If I love somebody, I can fully love them and I can step towards them without any ambivalence, um, without any guilt. I can fully give myself to um, the relationships that I'm choosing now and building. And to me, that's, that's the most exciting thing about working with enmeshed folks is to see them um, move from guilt and obligation to passion and purpose in their lives. So um, that's the lecture part. I see that we have a lot of Q&A. Um, Scott, I'll just ask that we can prioritize the questions about enmeshment today. Yeah. And then um, we'll do. the ones we can get to another time if we run out of time. Yeah. Um, before we jump into the questions, did you use the term bonsai child or box child or both uh it's, it's interchangeable okay. um, and actually it comes from this internet gag from when i was a teenager a, a music artist that i really liked at the time got all up in arms about this website called bonsai kitties and it was these photoshop pictures of cats in glass bottles and he was an animal rights activist and, you know, was really upset by this. And then later had to uh, issue an apology that that was clearly a gag and not a real thing. But I think about it all the time, the, the awfulness of living in a life that's constructed around you instead of the life that you choose. Yeah, no, I asked because I heard bonsai. I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> that's me. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Um, OK. Um, so this first question, it's kind of a long one. I'm going to draw out the pertinent part. Um, how does sexually acting out relieve the pain of physical and verbal abuse by my mom, who was also very loving? Um, I have never felt I was acting out in order to gain relief from pain. And if this was an unconscious way of seeking relief, how does this knowledge help in gaining freedom from sexual addiction? So this is, I assume, an enmeshed mother who was physically and verbally abusive, but also very loving, which... Hmm. And moms often are. Yeah. Um, so how does this knowledge help? Um, I, I think the knowledge of what your sexual acting out does for you, um, it, it starts to get you focused not on is what I'm doing right or wrong, it's does it actually solve my problems? I could see in this situation without further assessment, so know that this is like shooting from the hip and not specific advice, but but some impression. Um, there's a lot of confusion when you have an abusive parent who's also very loving. Um, you may not know how to feel about that from day to day or who you are in relation to this person. So um, the acting out may be about pain relief. It could also just be about, I'm turning off my brain because this is so, I can't wrap my mind around it. I'm confused. I just want some breathing room. So um, gaining a knowledge of that unconscious stuff, it gives you choice. When we make the implicit explicit, we can exercise choice. You can't exercise choice when you're actually not fully informed or fully present. Yeah, yeah and I will just add that for me, um, the secret life was the escape. It was the relief. Um, it didn't matter so much what the secret life was. It was that I had one. Yeah. And I could get away from this person a little bit um, and sort of make my own choices secretly, <laughs> as long as it didn't reflect badly on her. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I heard, what will people think of me? <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, single mother and meshed men, destructive relationship history, not currently dating, um, ambivalent about relationships with women, uh, with fear and resentment toward women. There's no question here, but is that common? And why is it common if it is? Yeah, I was going to say sounds about right. 
um, some general reasons why enmeshed folks uh, have a destructive relationship history or can't aren't currently in a relationship is because the ambivalence. It requires relationships are hard. It is some of the hardest work you'll ever do. And in order to do that, again, you have to give yourself over to an obligation. I want this and I will do what it takes to make this work. When the loyalty is split, you can't make that kind of commitment. So the ambivalence is the way that you preserve the loyalty and you're trying to make your current partner happy as well. It's, it's the compromise. It's a troublesome compromise that you make. And then of course there would be fear and resentment if your experience with your, your first primary caregiver was that they engulfed you. It's really common that we transfer that sphere of enmeshment or that fear of enmeshment onto a romantic partner. You're going to gobble me up just like mom did. And there's actually, we won't get into this too much right now, but there's a lot that uh, enmeshed men do in relationships that sets up that very dynamic and that very feeling. We go in and we make the expectations high and then we become a human again. And of course, our partner is upset about, well, what happened to the guy who is so sensitive? Well, that's just the way that I know how to be in the beginning of a relationship, but I can't sustain it because nobody can. Yeah. Come closer, come close. Too close. Yep. Yep. It's starting to feel like mom, you know. Yeah. Um, um, what is the relationship, if any, between BPD and enmeshment? I'm going to assume BPD is bipolar disorder, but you may have another reading on uh, that. That's, that's what I know BPD as. Um, so uh, there's no research that I'm aware of on this. I will talk about one dynamic in uh, that, that uh, folks who are suffering with borderline are known for. They have a really hard time regulating their own emotions. So you'll see a lot of like the relationship drama and uh, relationship, sorry, relationship drama and shaming. A lot of the relationship approaches um, are about getting internal regulation. So it's it's not not every enmeshed person has a borderline parent. I could see in situations with a borderline and parent, parent that uh, the dynamic for enmeshment can be set up well because there is a need for external regu regulation with the parent. And again, like I said, it's one of the most natural things in the world for a parent to turn to their kids and get that. There's also a lot that we do naturally that's not good for us. So just because it comes up naturally doesn't mean that it's it's great. In fact, I think a lot of our like adulthood and, and good parenthood is resisting our, our impulses to do that, which is convenient, but not helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think I said bipolar disorder and what I meant to say was borderline personality disorder, which is I think what, what you were talking about, yeah. um, which is BPD. Um, how do I dismantle the damage of enmeshment that I unawarely attach or manifest toward my wife? I think you talked a little bit about this, but maybe some but, specific. Well, the phrase stuff. that Dr. Adams will use, he'll often remark to people, you're angry at the wrong woman. So a lot of uh, enmeshed folks that I work with, they come in wanting to deal with their marriage and their, uh, their spouse's unreasonable expectations. If there's an enmeshment dynamic going on, I'll say deal with your, your mother or your father first. Um, get those boundaries right and resolve those feelings for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you have any kind of ongoing loyalty that's taking your energy, um, you're going to see everybody as trying to take from you and trying to control you. Um, it makes, I think, logical therapeutic sense to deal with the origin first. So I'll often say uh, to these, these folks that I work with, why don't we put uh, perspectives and uh, decisions about your relationship on hold? This is one of the things that the, the enmeshment workshop's really, really good at is we focus purely on um, the original enmeshment dynamic and help you untangle that. It's been very rare that I've seen a guy leave that workshop with the same level of ambivalence toward his relationship that he had when he entered same level of conflict inside yeah thank you um next one here um how do i break the repetition compulsion um i think this is referring to i date my mother basically uh in relationships with women who are like mother uh in other words they are critical hostile defensive shaming etc um you first have to do some assessment and some diagnostics uh so we say uh enmeshed men 
will either pick a partner who's like their mom or they'll provoke her to be like mom. So I would say first you got to figure out, am I actually picking women who like uh, my mom or do I have a knack for evoking that dynamic out of people? And do we, if we choose to evoke that dynamic consciously or unconsciously, is it because that's the dynamic that we know and the dynamic that feels like love um, or that feels safe? I mean, why would we, why yeah. do we do that? Well, it's, it's, I think it's hard because in some ways relationships are the most natural. I, I should say getting into relationships are, is like the most natural thing for humans to do. Um, you've probably all heard we're wired for connection. doesn't mean we're good at it. We just want it. And, and actually, I would say when human beings just follow their instinct for relationships and connection, um, they get terrible relationships and terrible connection. There's a reason why we have developed outer cortex and we can we can uh, connect cause and effect because it's more complicated than just I'll, I'll do what I feel and it'll go right. So it may not be uh, it may not be what, what's the word I'm looking for unique uh, to enmeshment um, that we provoke. I think everybody runs the liability of getting into a relationship and just doing what they think makes a good relationship instead of really getting to know and feel the person you're in a relationship with and doing what works for both of you. Thank you. Um, is it possible for a man who is enmeshed to be emancipated or to become emancipated without professional help? Um, if you're If you're talking straight yes or no, sure. Um, I would, but in, go, but in reality, well, I would go with the, the odds. Yeah. Why wouldn't you stack the odds more in your favor? Yeah. yeah, you might be able to find it. I mean, um, Dr. Adams, uh, again, he, he came by this honestly as well in his journey. He didn't have an enmeshment therapist, but he used a lot of therapy. Um, the beginning of my journey, I wasn't working with an enmeshment therapist, but I used a lot of therapy. Um, so with, with any problem you're dealing with, can you do it by yourself? Strictly speaking, sure, possible. Uh, why not stack, stack the deck more in your favor? Yeah, total, totally agree. <laughs> um, um, how can an isolated mother enmeshed man date safely in recovery? Interesting question. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would say hone in on your susceptibility to inappropriate guilt and forced obligation. Um, if you can stay out of those dynamics, um, you will be exponentially safer in all of your relationships. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add one of the things we do at, at Seeking Integrity, and I suspect John does it with his clients as well, when they're ready to date is we have them create what we call a traffic signals dating plan. You know, the red lights are, here are the things that I absolutely will not put up with. And all of the enmeshment issues would go under the red lights. And then there's yellow <laughs> lights, like somebody is habitually late without calling or, or, you know, things like that. And then there's green lights, like, you know, we have mutual interests, we enjoy time together, you know, we split the duties evenly, things like that. Um, is that something you do with your clients, John? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I would, uh, I think a pretty uh, safe red light, uh, a safe thing to be a red light if, if you're an enmeshed man, um, safe, wanting to safely date in recovery. If you find yourself thinking in terms of would mom like this person, um, pull back, <laughs> uh, reconfigure. Um, I, I've heard countless men who have said I picked a partner based on who my mom liked not who I liked um and that's that's a, that's a tragedy for both you and the the person that you choose so that, that would be another one of those like real low-hanging fruit um you can date safely in recovery when you're not thinking about what are people going to think about my partner and you're thinking about what do I think about this person yeah um, will this workshop be able to be available to view later? Yes, it will. Um, I will post this on our YouTube channel um, within an hour or two of this meeting. Um, as soon as it processes through Zoom, I'll get it up. 
Um, so yes, and it's uh, we're obviously going to continue uh, two weeks from today with questions we don't get to today. So there will be uh, a part one and a part two. Um, okay, next one here. How can a single mother enmeshed man break out of the learned helplessness and futility uh, from the effects of the disloyalty bind uh, in the psyche? Um, great question. question. Yeah. Um, so in, in the level one workshop, we do an exercise uh, called the enmeshment relapse. And uh, in the end, the men come up with a line that describes what the relapse is and um, that also uh, embodies what they need to do about it. One of my favorite answers a guy ever came up with is he said, uh, this is my life to mess up. Um, that comes up for me here because I think the learned helplessness is more, I don't want to disappoint and I, I don't want to get things wrong. Uh, that's really in common for, that's really common for enmeshed men um, to feel that. And so it's, it's less of a, I can't and more of, I can't without disappointing someone. And the truth is all of our decisions end up disappointing somebody. So it's a matter of choosing who you're going to disappoint and why. And, and so I think a, a really great way to start that is accept that you'll fail and uh, that's okay, especially if it's your failure. If it's your failure, you can turn it all sorts of angles. You can learn from it. You can look, uh, look at it. You can turn it into fertilizer that, that, that grows success later. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I'd come up there uh, and embrace the fact that you will make mistakes, things won't go right. And um, it's actually a really great thing for you to learn from. Get those knees dirties, dirty, um, break some windows, metaphorically speaking. Don't go break windows. Yeah, so, um, or even get your knees dirty unless you really want to. <laughs> yeah. so, um. and, I, and I say that, I say that because in, in my own story, um, my, my mom was a nurse and also just an anxious individual. And there's a lot that I pulled back from, I'm, I'm kind of a nitty gritty dirt under your fingernails. Uh, like I, I feel most alive when I'm adventuring, I pulled back from that because my mom was worried about how I would get hurt. And a, a lot of enmeshment that I work with have a similar drive in them. I would have done more. I would have taken more risks, but my parent was worried. So that's where I say, you know, get your knees dirty um don't be afraid of failure or at least check in is is the fear of failing here mine or my my parents okay this is from a mother and meshed man who is also a, a sex porn and love addict in recovery um the behaviors are under control with the help of the 12-step program um what's next um so we got a mother and mesh man who's got his sex porn love addiction you know in check and awesome. good for you. What's next? Awesome. Uh, some some relationship focused uh, treatment, meaning uh, so so the workshops can be really good. The enmeshment workshops, if you haven't done them, um, it's a really really great way to get a leg up and a focus on what uh, is happening in enmeshment. Um, a 12-step fellowship that I really love for uh, help with family dynamics, not just enmeshment, but other family dynamics that impact us as adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families. Um, that can be a really great place to go next. Because if, if we look at the relationship between addiction and this kind of like attachment wound, addiction is the numbing, it's the medicine. So if you're not taking your numbing medicine anymore, you can feel and see what the original hurt is better. It doesn't mean that it's healed. It just means that you're not running from it. It gets healed by dealing with it, by looking at it, um, by, by working with it. So those are two, um, two good places to make some next steps. Yeah. And just to tag on to that a little bit, John, um, you know, when we get our addiction under control, it is time to work on our underlying issues. Um, if you are mother enmeshed or parentally enmeshed, it is an issue to work on, but it's probably not the only issue to work on. So is there an order to do it or is it the most pressing? How does, you know, because we, we tend to have a plethora of underlying issues. Yeah, um, 
I would say, and this isn't just because I do enmeshment work, I really try not to be the whole like I'm a hammer and the world's a nail um, type of a thing. I do think enmeshment is a priority uh, to work on because everything else relies on you being able to feel yourself and know yourself. And if you're enmeshed, the uh, psychic presence of another person or their demands or their desires of you is always going to interfere. So again, the, the goal of enmeshment recovery is not to amputate. It's not to cut and say, you know, get out of my life. It's to learn how to come into your own space and your own body and your own feelings and um, make decisions and, and put on perspectives that you then take a step out of yourself um, into the world uh, and, and to be able to do that fluidly. So I, I think enmeshment recovery is a, it's a, it's a pretty important priority. Yeah, I, I thank you for that. And I, I totally agree. I, I mean, it's kind of the elephant in the room that has to be dealt with um, in terms of the underlying issues if somebody's really enmeshed. I mean, at least for me, uh, I had to differentiate before I could heal the rest of me. Um, mm -hmm. Because otherwise I was going to be trying to heal my mother. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not not feasible. Yeah. Um, okay, my wife thinks that I'm a mother enmeshed man. On hearing John talk, it seems to me that more than anything, I'm enmeshed with my wife. Um, is there a world in which I'm enmeshed with both my mother and my wife? Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you. And how do I convey that I need to ind individuate on both fronts, basically? So, um, and and by the way, and, and I'm going to tack on a little bit. If I individuate from my mother, will I automatically sort of have a better <laughs> relationship with my wife? Uh, I wouldn't say there's automatically a better relationship. I think there's a better you, there's a firmer you. Um, sometimes it happens that when we work on a personal part of recovery, we change and, uh, the people that we're in relationship don't love that change. It's not the person that they fell in love with or the person that they want. That's not a guarantee that this happens here. My, my thought here. As I wonder in, in situations, I, I mean, I hear something like this almost weekly in my email inbox or somebody who's calling me. I wonder, have you read as much and listened to as much about uh, mother enmeshment as your spouse has? And if not, why? Um, if you're going to go toe to toe and say, you don't know what you're talking about, do you know what they're talking about? Um, it might be good instead of just focusing on individuating, um, it might be good to focus on what exactly are the dynamics with my family and with my spouse. Sounds like you feel pretty clear on what the dynamic is with your spouse, great. Uh, you might wanna dig into the dynamic with your family. Um, there's a lot of danger, I think, in uh, going with the, I just got to get out of this feel. I think the solutions that come up when we're in the, I just got to get out of this place, they're not great long-term solutions. We have to sit with pain and discomfort a little bit longer and a little bit more in depth so we know exactly what the problem is. Um, so it is, it is really important. In enmeshment recovery, we talk about setting aside your mother's opinion about your father and developing your own. Um, it's the same thing with our families. Uh, our, our spouses as an outsider, they can see things and feel things that people who are inside the family don't see and feel or can't recognize. So uh, take it with a grain of salt, but don't discard it. If your spouse is reading this stuff and listening to this stuff and saying, I think there's something here for you, what harm is there in going there and investigating yourself and becoming at least as well read as your partner is? Yeah, and, and the books to read are Silently Seduced and When He's Married to Mom. Those would be the, the where to start. <laughs> I popped that in the chat feature, both by Ken Adams, obviously. Yeah. Yep. Um, is it unrealistic to hope that getting into a romantic relationship can assist the recovery of a mother in mesh man? Yes. Um, and maybe, maybe more generally, <laughs> should guys who are still in mesh to mom be looking for a new new relationship? Here's, here's what I would say. Uh, yes, it's unrealistic to hope because what I don't hear in there is an active voice. I'd have a completely different response to this question. Is it if 
if I wanted to be part of a, a romantic relationship is, is trying to do a romantic relationship well, can that help the recovery of men? Yes, because you're activating yourself. If you're hoping to be the victim of a good relationship, um, again, the setup's all wrong. Life doesn't happen to us. Or I should say the life that happens to us isn't the one that takes good care of us. The life that we intentionally build is the one that takes good care of us. Same with our relationships. Yeah. Um, okay, next one here. And this, this is a great question. We may end on this one. <laughs> um, how can a mother enmeshed man get past the resistance to paying for and signing up for uh, your workshop? Um, yeah, um, I always think in terms, and actually, so, so when I'm a consumer of therapy, or I'm a consumer of like this kind of help, I often think about it in terms as the price of freedom. So, so currently I'm actually, I'm working with a nutrition coach on some intuitive eating principles. I discovered, well not discovered, I, I got concerned a couple months ago that I was not uh, loving my body. And I had a lot of, you know, negative thoughts and feelings about living in the body that I have. Um, so I, I did a couple of you know consultations and I got I got prices, and I always ask myself um, what what am I willing to pay for freedom? And it right sizes the question. It's not is that a lot of money? Often it is. It's an investment. And I'll tell you as a therapist on this side, um, clients who pay to the point that they feel it get more. I think. Um, so I think that's how you get past it is what, what's my freedom worth to me? Yeah. And, um, I don't know if you guys have testimonials on the website, but I, I know a number of people who have taken this workshop and they are blown away by it. And by the way, I personally am thinking about the, uh, one right before Labor Day, because that's a good time for me. And I would love to, I need it. And I know I need it. You know, I need it. You've known for a long time. I need this. Um, I am going to pull one more question, um, and that this is the one we'll end on. Um, how can and this is coming from the therapist out there. Thank you for being here. Um, what support is there for the spouse of an enmeshed man? Yeah, so um, we have a workshop for spouses um, that deals with uh, it. It's not here's how to take care of your enmeshed partner it's starting to come to grips with and validating the anger and the betrayal that you feel. Um, I think it's chapter eight of when he's married to mom is written to spouses. Um, that is some good support. And again, all of our, so, so over the past three years, Dr. Adams has been training um, enmeshment informed therapists. And um, over the next year or two, we're looking at taking that up a notch um, and having something above uh, enmeshment informed. But there's a lot of therapists around the country now. I don't remember exactly how many, um, but you can contact Dr. Adams' office for a list of enmeshment informed therapists. And they're also, uh, they, they get training on um, supporting spouses um, with this. So as, as with all things, the, the family of the person who's suffering um, resources for them lag behind the resources for the person who's suffering. Um, but again, those, those are some good places to start. Yeah. Um, thank you, John. We're out of time, everybody. I have copied and saved all of these questions we didn't get to into a document. John will be back in two weeks. And with his permission, we'll just continue the Q&A. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So come back in two weeks. Um, I'll do a little promo on it to remind everybody. Um, we had a great crowd today. I will get this posted on YouTube as quickly as I can. Um, it'll be um, sometime later today. Um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks, John. Thank you again. Anything you want to say to take us out? No, thank you so much, everybody, for coming and all of the questions. Um, please either come back in two weeks or find the recording. Um, I'm, I'm anxious to see those. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, John. Bye.